Welcome to Minnesota Legislative Report, our region's longest running public affairs program. Lawmakers from Northeastern Minnesota are joining us today for a recap of the week's activities at the state capitol. Minnesota Legislative Report starts now. Hello and welcome to the Minnesota Legislative Report. I'm your host, Tony Sertich, and I'm hosting from my home again, and our guests will also be remote as we abide by the governor's stay-at-home order. We're recording this show ahead of time, but we encourage you to email your questions for next week to ask at wdsc.org. You'll find the email address at the bottom of your screen during today's program. Joining us this week is Representative Liz Olson, the House Majority Whip and a Democrat from Duluth. Welcome, Representative Olson. Thanks for having me. And Representative Sandy Lehman is a Republican from Cohasset representing House District 5B. Welcome, Representative Lehman. Thank you, Tony. Looking forward to our discussion today. Absolutely. Well, let's get started with this week's floor session in the House. Representative Olson, I understand legislators were positioned in various places across the state capitol property to maintain a safe physical distancing during your last session. Can you tell us a bit about that? Yeah, so it's unusual times, but the legislature is still working and we're still functioning as best as we can while adhering to the MDH guidelines to keep us all safe. Uh, and one of the last times, I can't remember, maybe it's a month ago, the time is kind of a blur, but when we were able to meet last as a full body in the House, we were able to vote on some remote voting rules, which allowed us to be able to vote remotely and safely from different places. So the last time we met uh, to pass some emergency COVID-19 legislation, we were able to do so safely. We had a few members that were in the House with the Speaker of the House presiding, but the majority of us were actually voting remotely um, through our telephones in places in St. Paul or out in greater Minnesota at our homes. And again, that was something that we enabled through a change in House rules that allowed us to do that. And so we were able to keep conducting the, the business of the people, but do it safely. So we're gonna keep doing that until um, we're able to get through this crisis and all meet safely again in the House chambers. Great. And Representative Lehman, what was your experience uh, for these unusual House sessions? Well, it's really been unusual, Tony, and as a former um, representative and majority leader of the House, um, you can only imagine how different this, this has been. I have participated um, both on the floor as one of the few that was you know, spread apart according to social distancing guidelines. And then this last um, session that we had this week, I participated from my apartment um, in St. Paul. And this week, tomorrow, I'll participate from home in Cohasset. So, you know, I, I think all of us will be doing business differently in the future. And we certainly are doing business differently in the legislature. Sure. And let's get to the heart of what uh, you've worked on thus far this week. I know that uh, a fourth round of COVID-19 response legislation was passed, primarily around policy and some um, HHS funding uh, for food. Representative Lehman, do you want to talk a bit about that piece of legislation? Yeah, well, we've, we've uh, met, um, I think the last three sessions have all been COVID-19 related. And um, just leading up to the session, uh, your viewers might be interested in hearing how differently we're working in that regard. Um, I, I'm really pleased at how we've been able to respond very quickly to this pandemic and this emergency. And we've done it in a very unique way. We've done it by responding to the governor's requests and forming work groups. And these work groups have been uh, uh, made up of two House members, two Senate members from both parties. We come together and actually formulate the proposals that we're, we're hearing now on the floor. And these proposals, by and large, are all COVID related. And this last um, uh, week, um, we actually had one sort of non-COVID related, and that was the insulin bill. Um, that's something that I think everybody's aware of. The Senate and the House have been working all through the summer and into the fall, and now um, we finally have have passed the insulin bill that will provide insulin to the uninsured, to people who can't afford it. It has a short-term component to it and a longer-term component to it. So um, our, our insurance providers and our manufacturers have really stepped up to the plate. Uh, and this piece of legislation sort of just fills in the gaps to ensure that no diabetic in the state of Minnesota will go without their insulin. 
so that was one big piece of our um, of our legislation this week. But then we also did a number of bills that just made it easier to get your marriage license online, um, to get your driver's, you know, commercial driver's license, all the things that we need to do face to face. Um, even allowed for um, online meetings of local government officials. Just tweaking some current legislation and making it more flexible during this time. Thanks. And Representative Olson, do you want to talk a bit about the COVID-19 response and also serving on the Health and Human Services Committee? Uh, you probably have some more to say about the Alex Smith Emergency Insulin Act as well. Yeah, so we're actually meeting as the HHS committee this afternoon via Zoom, so similar format to today, and we're going to be talking about testing and next steps. I think we've heard, you know, the urgency around the crisis we're in, and we're doing a great job in Minnesota at bending the curve, but we're also starting to think about what's the next chapter look like for Minnesota, and how do we come out of this, and what kind of testing do we need, and what do we need to ensure that we don't have this continue to flare up. So we're going to be talking about that in HHS. But in regards to what was passed off the floor and signed into law by the governor this week, the COVID-19 response, I think in particular to probably most of our listeners or viewers up here, is we also know that we're doing things differently around our need for accessing healthcare, whether that be mental health, um, chemical dependency. And so we were approving some, or some telehealth, uh, being able to allow DHS to have more flexibility in how we work through telehealth. And that was something we've heard in the health and human services realm a lot is as people are having to stay home and we're in a crisis um, that people really need to still have access to their doctors, their mental health practitioners, their chemical dependency folks. So we were able to do some more with that work in our uh, COVID-19 response. Another thing we did in the bill that I think is really good, we know a lot of people are hungry, um, that access to food during this time is hard for a lot of people, especially when they're unemployed, um, when they're their families are all home together. And so one of the pieces we did too is through our ag committee is we were able to have uh, food shelves and, uh, and food banks being able to access fresh milk and proteins, uh, which not only helps people get the food that they need and the protein in the milk, but it also helps our agriculture community continue to produce and continue to have a place for that to go. So um, every time we meet, we're doing really powerful work because we know this crisis impacts every one of us, but it especially impacts those who fall through the cracks on a normal day and are feeling it so much more now. And so I think we're able to continue to do that work and continue to do it in a bipartisan way, which is great. Um, and the Insulin Affordability Act, the Alex Smith Insulin Affordability Act was great and it's been a year in the making. Um, and I, Mike Howard, who carried the bill in the house, I think said really eloquently that the status quo doesn't change unless we force it to. And this conversation was because of the parents of Alex Smith and so many insulin advocates throughout our state forcing a conversation that held the pharmaceutical companies to the table, brought them to the table, held them accountable, and made sure that everyone can afford insulin. Um, you know, this crisis is about a lot of things, but I think it really showed in our society so many things that we've known have been wrong for so long. And this was just, even though it wasn't specifically COVID-19 related, it really took such a long time to get here and really righted a long-term wrong that had been happening around uh, insulin prices being jacked up, people not being able to afford it, and people dying. So we made a huge step forward, and it's really landmark legislation that I know other states are looking at. So um, even though it was only one session, you know, over the course of a week, it was a really powerful session, and I think how it will improve people's lives. So. We'll continue to do this work and continue to do it in as bipartisan way as we possibly can and still bring people what they need, even in a time of crisis. And there was strong bipartisan support on both pieces of those legislation. There was also some discussion and debate around uh, Governor Walz's emergency peacetime executive order, which uh, both of you might have a little different take on. Uh, Governor Walz uh, had a 30-day emergency peacetime executive order put in place, and he moved to extend it, which the legislature then can vote on. And there was some robust discussion around extending uh, that executive order. Wondering if you could both comment uh, on your take on the extension of his peacetime executive order. Representative Blayman, why don't you go first? Sure. Uh, thanks, Tony. Uh, well, I think all of your listeners um, are sort of feeling the pain. Um, you know, we're, we're really concerned about the pandemic and keeping our loved ones safe and healthy. And I think we can all universally say that our governor has shown strong leadership and he's instilled confidence uh, in, you know, among his, uh, the residents of Minnesota. 
Um, I think, you know, his communication skills have shined through. He's done daily updates, keeping us all informed. I mean, I can only relate this to maybe World War II where, where people sat around the radio and listened to President Roosevelt. <laughs> you know, we're all sitting around the radio listening to Governor Waltz give us our daily update. Um, but I think people uh, are ready to start opening up the economy again. Um, it, you know, it's really striking a balance between keeping us safe from this particular virus and keeping us whole. Um, you know, we understand that our businesses, uh, some of them are uh, sort of on the brink of not opening again if we continue uh, to keep them shuttered and continue to stay at home. So when the governor issued the last extension for the stay at home, I think some people provided a little bit of pushback on that. And um, I don't, you know, whether you're DFL or GOP, our inboxes are full of emails and our, our phones are ringing off the hook with business owners who are asking us questions about, can they get an exemption? Can they open up? I, uh, you know, just talking with a carpet and tile uh, retailer this week, and can they take appointments in their showroom, for instance? Um, resorters wondering, can they open for the season? You know, tourism is uh, really important, not just to our hospitality industry, but to our retailers and Main Street uh, businesses that provide on that influx of visitors coming in. And so um, at session, we had a couple of resolutions. Um, the one that I supported and was uh, unanimously supported by the Republicans was one that was offered by um, our minority leader, Kurt Doubt. And I think it was a very reasonable approach. It was a resolution that would have immediately ended the governor's emergency powers, but, but it would have kept in place many of the orders. For instance, it would have kept schools closed uh, until the May 4th deadline, but it would have allowed the bars and restaurants to open keeping social distancing. So it was a reasonable resolution, I thought. Um, it didn't get any debate, really. Um, and it was, you know, unfortunately, a partisan uh, vote. And of course, it, you know, being in the minority, it did not succeed. But I think that we need to keep the discussion going. Um, as a member of the Rural Caucus, Greater Minnesota legislators have written to the governor asking for a more reasonable approach. Um, I noticed that the Senate has opened up an online uh, site now for businesses to suggest how they might reopen and what kind of um, safeguards they might put in place to allow that to happen. I, th I think it's really important that the governor listen to businesses and listen to legislators. Um, we really respected his position as governor to this point, but what we're saying yesterday and we're saying continually now is governor, it's time to let others to the table. We, we know how to do this. Uh, we understand you know, that this is a different time, but we need to get people uh, back to work. Uh, and and uh, Tony, as you know, um, we now have some closures uh, of our Taconite plants. And so we're facing a summer of additional layoffs of our workers in the taconite industry and some real question marks in our tourism industry. So it's really time for the governor to now lay out a plan to reopen Minnesota's economy. Representative Olson, your take on this? Sure. So, I mean, obviously what we're feeling and what we're hearing from our constituents in Minnesota, it's real, it's painful. This is hard for everyone. Um, you know, whether it's business owners, frontline workers, whoever it is. I mean, this is a real tough time for all of us and there's no getting around the pain that people are feeling and the uncertainty of how much longer is this going to last. That said, Minnesota has some of the best public health workers in you know, the nation. Minnesota is nation leading in its you know, Department of Health and our approach here. And that is the thing that is so hard about public health is when you do it well, you prevent deaths from happening and people say you overreacted. And if you don't do enough, people die and say, and you, you're left to, you know, did we do enough? And in Minnesota, we're being, doing the right things. We're following our public health experts. The governor is doing a great job working hand in glove with our Department of Health and really listening to the epidemiologists, listening to our frontline medical community and making decisions based on that. And because of that, we're able to stem the tide of this, to bend the curve, to make sure that we have the necessary precautions set up with our hospitals. 
And so the governor is doing the right thing and continuing to listen to the people that understand this, that are data driven, that know that in order to get out of this, we have to be ready for what comes next and make sure we have the testing and the isolation, the ability to keep hot spots under control when they pop back up. So it's not as simple as just saying we need to open the economy. It's the approach we have to take to do that, to do it safely. Um, I talked to a business owner that supplies baked goods to other restaurants. And so his whole livelihood depends on other businesses being open. And he said that, you know, even with this, he wants these businesses to open, but he didn't know when he would feel safe to bring his family to a restaurant one that even would be where his livelihood existed until he knew that we had the proper guidelines set forward, enough testing, enough assurances that we'd be dealing with tracing and hot spots. And so that's really what's happening here. It's not that there isn't a desire or a work towards it. It's that we need to have the right things in place to do it. And so bringing up an amendment or a, a resolution on the House floor without any lead time, without any ability to ensure we have all of that seems like it's going against the face of public health experts. And so we need to do this right. We need to do it thoughtfully. We all know this is urgent and there's no denying that. And so I think there is a desire, I mean, from as you know, we hear it all over the state, um, that this is something we need to do, but we need to do it in a way that doesn't put Minnesotans at further risk, um, that makes sure we're protecting those people. If we open up, uh, I heard my colleagues on the other side of the aisle talking about, well, we could isolate people in long-term care facilities. Well, who, who goes into those long-term care facilities to take care of people? It's workers, it's low-wage workers. We need to do a lot to ensure our, our economy is ready to handle what we decide to do. And I know the House is having several different committee hearings, like I mentioned in HHS today, around the testing, around where we go from here. So we're having those conversations, we're being thoughtful and deliberate and really letting the public health experts lead us and also understanding the urgency that maybe this is things we can do incrementally and we're gonna get there. So um, that's, you know, we'll continue to have those conversations. We'll continue to work towards the solution and do it in a way that keeps Minnesotans safe. And just as a reminder to the viewers, we're taping this on uh, Thursday. Uh, and so you all were, are gonna be going into session on Friday and then thinking about some of these ideas. Representative Lehman, what do you think some of those next steps should be uh, legislatively uh, on your agenda, COVID related or not, that you should you would like to see moving forward that the legislature address? Right. Well, I, you know, the, I'm in the minority, so I'm not setting the agenda. Uh, it's a lot of guesswork involved here about how we proceed forward, but we were in a recess until uh, April 14th and, and came back only at the call of the speaker. Um, and now we're back, we're out of recess, so we're resuming uh, sort of a normal schedule be it all that it's still online so we are now having committee meetings as representative olson said and uh, they're all online some of them are uh, some are on zoom some just on phone and and we're having regular sessions i expect that we're going to be having sessions a couple times a week again and i am hoping that we can um we will continue to respond to the covid crisis where, where we need to providing flexibility and so on but I'm hoping that we can move on to other legislation. I'm sure that Representative Olson, like I do, have bills that have, before all of this happened, have bills that have moved through all the committees and are actually sitting on the general register waiting for a vote. I'm hoping that we can get to some of those that already have gone through the entire process. And then I'm, I'm, I'm really hoping that we can do a couple of things. One is a bonding bill. Um, I think people expect that, and I think that expectation remains. Uh, we need to make those investments, and I think I think we will. Uh, the other thing is I'm I'm hoping for a tax bill. Um, you know, it's it's kind of crazy. About six weeks ago, I was asking for tax relief because we had a one you know we had a 1.5 billion dollar surplus that was forecasted. I think we all recognize now that with the shutdown of a big portion of our economy, that that forecasted surplus is no longer there. And in fact, we may come into 2021 facing a deficit. So I think we need to start paying attention to the fiscal impact of all of this. And I'm actually hoping that we have a tax bill or some tax measures. A couple of things I would like to do is I, um, I still would like to look at the businesses that have been forced to close and provide some flexibility for their payment of local property taxes. I'm not talking about all commercial businesses, I'm talking about just those 
small businesses that have been forced to close, give them a couple of months to pay their property taxes. Um, I would like a moratorium on any tax classification changes. Um, right now, there's uh, counties across northern Minnesota, all across the state that are taking our seasonal rec properties and moving them into a commercial classification. That's just causing havoc among our like Bluefin Bay Resort, Sugar Lake Lodge, and those where they're seeing a 350% increase in their, in their property taxes. So there's several tax measures that I would still like to see happen uh, that are non-COVID related, but are certainly going to help our businesses come out of this crisis uh, a little more healthy. Representative Wilson, what would you like to see uh, on the agenda moving forward for the legislative session? Well, I think there's the pieces that I, Sandy, Representative Lehman touched on that are the bipartisan pieces of legislation we need to move forward for our communities that maybe aren't COVID-19 related, but are queued up and ready to go. And I anticipate seeing more of that happening. I think Sandy, Representative Lehman mentioned the, the bonding bill, which at a time right now, even though there's some uncertainty around you know, our fiscal state and what that does in terms of the ability to have a robust bonding bill, but it's also the time to invest in infrastructure projects and jobs like coming out of this that may be one of the best things we could do is ensure a really robust bonding bill so that we can get our economy back on track through these infrastructure projects. So I think there is desire probably on both sides of the aisle and in both uh, bodies to, to move a bonding bill forward. So hope we can see more movement on that. Uh, there are some things that are still underlying in this COVID-19 that we're just not able to get across and, you know, have particularly uh, fallen on deaf ears in the Senate, but that we'll continue to talk about and push forward in the House. And one of those is uh, our hourly workers in schools and ensuring they're getting paid during this. We saw some uh, school closures and layoffs just recently in a couple communities where the hourly workers are not getting taken care of during this. And that's something we've been pushing in the House and the House Education Committee will be talking about more this week and I would anticipate seeing some motion on that uh, in the House as well as several other pieces of legislation that are kind of the unfinished business that we weren't able to get that bipartisan agreement with the Senate to be able to bring it to the floor during this time when we were only bringing bills to the floor that had that uh, agreement with all parties. And now with that ending, we're able to have more of the legislation brought forward to hopefully get to an agreement, but to have more of a conversation as we do that. Great. We just have a few minutes left. I want to ask about uh, the response from the federal level all the way through local. You know, the, all levels of government are trying to do their role in responding to this crisis. From your perspective as a state legislator, uh, Representative Lehman, how do you feel the coordination is going uh, from top to bottom, from federal to local, and all points in between? Well, I think that the federal government certainly has responded in a very big way. Um, we're expecting about $2 billion in help. Uh, I think it's one point, uh, uh, one a quarter billion will come into the state and, uh, and some additional funds that aren't quite clear as to how they'll be distributed to local governments. But all forms of government are, are going to need some support from the, uh, from the federal level. We all have to be careful of, um, of overspending on this. So it's kind of a, you know, we have, we have to pay attention to the deficit at the federal level as well as the state level. Um, the one, the one um, downside I'm hearing to the federal response is from local employers. Um, when the federal government expanded the unemployment program, um, they stretched it out an, an additional 12 weeks and, and that was very helpful. But they added uh, a $600 a week um, payment. And what's happened is that some people who are taking unemployment right now are actually making more than they made at their job. And so I'm hearing from a lot of employers that are concerned about attracting their employees back uh, when they need them. In fact, some employers have actually uh, applied for the PPP program, which is the payroll protection plan. That is a loan that is forgiven as long as they keep their people employed. But they've had employees actually refuse to come back because they're making more on unemployment. So that's a, a little unintended glitch that happened from the, from the federal side of things. Um, you know, I think our uh, Department of Employment and Economic Development has done a good job of turning that federal money around quickly, getting it out the door to businesses. Um, and I just want to give a shout out too, to our local communities. Um, in Itasca County, uh, people have pulled together like I, 
I'm, I'm so proud of our community. We have a slogan called Itasca Strong. And um, Itasca Economic Development Corporation has stepped up as the point of, uh, kind of first point of help. And they've developed their own loan program together uh, with the uh, city of Grand Rapids has a separate loan program. So everybody's working together to try and keep our businesses whole, whether it's government, uh, nonprofit or private, we're really working together. And I'm, I'm so proud of how people are responding. Okay, close to the end of time, Representative Olson, uh, some comments on the coordination across the different levels of government. I think I'm really thankful we had a strong governor who took the lead right away as we waited to see what was coming from the federal government and at times kind of uncertain response. So we had a strong state response right away and with the two billion coming in from the federal government, we're still diving through what that means, but uh, as Representative Lehman pointed out, we've had some great response from our state agencies already with BEAD being one of the first states to turn around and get the money out to people who needed it, which was really great. And locally too, we are really coordinating across. We are actually have a meeting after this with uh, various levels of our, with our mayor and our, our county commissioners and our state legislators to really talk about how we coordinate together around uh, our needs here in the community. So we're doing, I think Minnesota is doing a great job with a collaborative response and working as much as we can with what's coming from the federal government. That's great. And we're out of time, unfortunately. I'd like to thank State Representative Sandy Lehman and Liz Olson for joining us this week. And thank you for watching as well. Please join me again next week when we'll welcome more legislators from Northern Minnesota to the program. And remember to email your questions for next week's show to ask at wdsc.org. From the team at WDSC, I'm Tony Servich. It's been my pleasure to be with you today. Take care. 